Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the 20th Annual World Congress for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. Um, we are delighted to uh, have you all here and uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for being here and also thank the program committee um, and uh, also our upcoming uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Ramos, uh, for being here. And uh, before I uh, hand over the podium to our 20th president, Dr. Yamamoto, uh, let me just uh, make a couple of comments about uh, uh, Dr. Yamamoto, who has been with us for 20 years and uh, as one of the co-founders, she is the first donor to the organization. She donated 20 years ago, about $10,000 at that time to establish the organization. And, uh, and uh, uh, throughout the years, two decades, uh, Dr. Yamamoto uh, helped us uh, grow the organization. Uh, so we thank very much uh, 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 her effort, appreciate it. And uh, so that gets me to the point that, uh, uh, how do we define to be a SPMT member and what does it mean? Uh, like, what does it mean to be a Marine? Like, what does it mean to be a SPMT member? So uh, I think uh, over the years, we have defined this uh, multidisciplinary approach to um, discovery and neurotech innovation um, as our kind of platform, but also integrating policy into that. Uh, so, so Dr. Yamamoto will actually explain further about the accomplishments that uh, we had in last year meeting with the President of the United States and actually, um, you know, engaging the White House on uh, opiate addiction and uh, veterans issues as well as cancer moonshot. Uh, but uh, I, th I think uh, it's, it's important to, um, to mention that, uh, you know, we have created a movement uh, through SBMT to, for crossing discipline and uh, bringing scientists of different backgrounds together. So, um, also, I'm in pink today, uh, as you can see, uh, I'm making a statement here. Uh, we are very uh, keen about women in neuroscience, and we are very uh, supportive of uh, the uh, women movement in Iran, uh, who are uh, raised uh, against the tyranny, uh, and uh, they have raised their voice, women, uh, life, and freedom. Uh, so, Zanz and Yazadi. So, with that, um, we uh, support our colleagues, uh, female colleagues in this organization and it is a priority for us to engage more women in science. And uh, uh, I cannot find a better person to, uh, to, to represent women in science in SBMT and that's uh, our 20th president, Dr. Vicky Yamamoto. Please come to the podium. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so I was actually supposed to give a talk a little bit earlier because of uh, time and restriction, um, and Dr. Ramos actually has to leave after her talk. Um, actually, uh, she will be the, actually the first uh, speaker. So uh, it is a pleasure to uh, introduce you, uh, Dr. Uh, Diana Ramos. Uh, Dr. Ramos is a Surgeon General of uh, California, appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom back in August of 2022. Dr. Ramos has served as a public health administrator at the California Department of Public Health uh, Center for Healthy Communities since 2021. Prior to becoming the Surgeon General, um, Dr. Uh, Ramos was a public health medical officer at the California Department of Public Health and Director of Reproductive Health at the uh, LA County uh, Department of Public Health uh, Men uh, Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Division. Uh, Dr. Ramos uh, serves in many leadership roles in healthcare, uh, including uh, as an executive board member of the California Maternal Care Quality Collaborative, uh, secretary of the National Hispanic Medical Association Executive Board, 
and as a co-chair of the Women's uh, Preventive uh, Service Initiative Implementation, Implementation Committee. And uh, I'm actually proud to say that she is a double Trojan. Uh, she first obtained an undergraduate degree at the USC and then went to Keck School of Medicine of USC to receive her medical degree. She uh, also was trained in OBGYN in LA County USC Medical Center. And she also uh, obtained MPH from UCLA as well as MBA from UC Irvine. So the title of her talk will be A Look to the Future of California's Health. Priorities and opportunities in mental health and beyond. We are very honored and to have you as our first keynote speaker, Dr. Ramos. Good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation for being here, Dr. Yamamoto for the nice introduction, and it is my pleasure to be here with all of you to talk about what my priorities are as Surgeon General for California. But in particular, I'm gonna really highlight the mental health piece because prior to becoming Surgeon General, one of the programs that I oversaw for the state was Alzheimer's and dementia. So you can uh, believe that I had the opportunity to really understand impact, not only as oversight for the program for California, but more importantly because of the fact that my aunt, one of my uh, very favorite aunts, has dementia and has al Alzheimer's, and I'm seeing firsthand how it impacts not only her health, but my entire family's health. And we all know that it's the caregivers oftentimes that are more impacted than the patients themselves. So thank you all of you for all of the work that you're doing. I saw agenda that there, there's a lot of Alzheimer's sessions going on and if we can help prevent dementia, prevent Alzheimer's, you know, you, you have an advocate in me. I, I think it's a very uh, important priority and thank you all for, for working on that. Let's see here. Okay, so overall my priorities are in mental health adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, and reproductive health. In OBGYN, I would be remiss if I would not take advantage of my training that I received at LA County USC. And so as such, it is, my focus is spanning the entire scope of reproductive health, and that has to do with contraception, um, abortion care when needed, and then maternal morbidity and mortality. So the, if you want to find more information on reproductive health, go to the website. We just launched a, a brand new web pages. I'm going to be focusing on the mental health and ACEs and toxic stress during this presentation. So mental health as a priority. Next slide. It's not. So really important to give you some data, um, and, and some of you are aware of this, some of you, it may be new information, but it's the leading cause of hospitalization for children under 18 in California. COVID has um, pulled the curtain on the mental health issues that our society has. It's not that mental health issues just started, it was more that COVID pulled the curtain and we now realize that we are all impacted. Whether or not we admit it to ourselves, all of us have been impacted. And some of this is seen in the emergency rooms. When I shared this data with some of my colleagues, they said, you know, Diana, it's not the fact that it's just the children, it's adults as well. Because adults will come in complaining of some other somatic symptom and they won't say it's mental health, but they'll say they have abdominal pain, they have a headache. And when you do more history, more questioning, you come to realize, wow, it's actually um, mental health source. Other data in terms of kids, one in three seventh and ninth graders and one in two 11th graders experience chronic sadness. And this is really important. I don't know about you, how, how old your kids are, but my son is an 11th grader. And so when I look at him and he's sitting next to one of his friends, I think, okay, which one is the one that's chronically sad? And sometimes I could pick it up with my son, but sometimes not. But this is something that is really important for us to come to the realization that this is something that is 
uh, more pervasive than what we think. And the rate of suicide among black youth in California doubled between 2014 and 2020. Um, the other piece that's not on here is that LGBTQ plus youth have cited that they have 60% of chronic sadness as well. So no one is immune. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is, what your education is. We are all susceptible to issues having to do with mental health. For adults, 54% of parents and caregivers, and these are as a result of the pandemic, uh, reported negative impact on their mental health. So we as adults, we as the caretakers are the ones that are also experiencing the, the impact on all the stresses that mental health, um, that COVID uh, pulled the curtain on. 60% of black and Hispanic low income mothers and parents have a negative impact on their mental health as a result of work disruption. We have to remember too that it was oftentimes the people of color that were not able to work remotely. They, were, they had to actually go in to their work areas. They, if they worked for the grocery, uh, the supermarket, if they were medical assistants, they were the ones that had to be there in person. They could not work remotely. And so that really impacted them more, especially when the kids were left home alone. And I heard you know, many stories of this happening and the kids were having to do school remotely you know, using the video. 34% of California uh, caregivers also cite feeling nervous or stress. And I, I, every time I, I speak about this, I, and I speak to a group of physicians, I have to really highlight the fact that, unfortunately, we are also impacted. One doctor dies by suicide every day in the United States. If we think about it, that's 365 doctors a year. We talk about the physician shortage, right? And how are we going to replace physicians? How are we going to help keep physicians alive. This is the equivalent of two medical school classes if you look at a major uh, university. So we really have to realize that. And so it's by looking at the data, by making ourselves aware of what is happening that we can then start to help. Female doctors are three times more likely to die by suicide. Before it was that women were, you know, they thought about doing it, but they didn't do it. But now we, female, physicians are three times more likely to die by suicide. Physicians experience the highest suicide rate of any profession, and 29% of practicing physicians reported depression, a rate twice that of U.S. adults. So one in three physicians. Again, no one is immune. On the, um, uh, the picture there, the Dr. Mom Foundation is actually a foundation that was started in memory of two physicians that uh, committed suicide. And it's a foundation that is helping um, doctors who need the support. There is a lot of work that is being done through the California Medical Association. Through the American Medical Association, there's actually a webinar coming up on March 9th focusing on burnout. And we know that burnout also contributes to the whole slew of mental health and depression. Um, and so really important to realize that there are resources available to get help. The first thing is to become aware and accept that, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm feeling a little bit more sad and uh, we as physicians are the worst patients, right? There's a lot of denial, but once we come to that realization, we can get the help that we need. So what are we doing in California? So Governor Newsom has invested over $4.7 billion, that's with a B, to address um, behavioral health. How are we gonna really address mental health in, in California? So just to give you the context of how much $4.7 billion is, that's the equivalent of um, more than the health budget for eight states in the United States. So we have just on one initiative focused, uh, invested on mental health. He wants to reimagine we have to address mental health in a different way because what we're doing is not working. And to that end, this investment is uh, in, for people who are zero to 25 years old. So some people in, my, in the room are like, well, wait, that doesn't include me. It doesn't include you, but it includes your children. It includes 
perhaps your, you know, the, the students that you work with, it's up to 25 years old. And so the new models that are being created are being developed through focus groups, through input from young people, various ages, that is providing equitable care, care that is available 24 seven, that is really focusing on no wrong door, meaning that wherever they go for help, they're actually gonna find help and uh, free of stigma. So a lot of work that's being done. We have until 2026 to actually implement this. There is um, an app that is being developed that is gonna be available for youth so up to 25 years old so that they can get the help um, at night because we heard from youth that I like to do some uh, chatting at night when I'm in bed and I don't want to talk to a person initially, right? Everything is text. Everything is virtual. So the programs are being created with what they are asking for. So we will soon find out, you know, what the programs are going to look like. They're going to be um, pilot tested and I really think that we are going to be leading the country in creating a solution of how are we going to help our youth. The investment also pulls in communities. The investment also pulls in um, hiring 40,000 community health workers, right? Because we know that we cannot do it alone. We as physicians have maybe 10, 15 minutes if we're lucky with our patients, but who can actually do more? And that's what's happening outside in the community and recognizing it. That's why there, there's being um, development of uh, new opportunities for grants, for community organizations to train and hire community health workers for peer-to-peer -peer training as well. So we're looking and we're thinking outside the box, what can we do to really help those who need the help with mental health. My office has uh, a $24 million investment in developing a public awareness campaign on stress and what can you do. The focus, as you can see, is for often populations that are not um, first in mind, but this campaign will be first in mind and we are in the process of finalizing our contract and it should be launched in 2023 because it is through awareness, through making the public, um, giving them the information of what does stress look like? What does stress when it becomes prolonged and for long periods of time, which is what we call toxic stress, what are the effects that it can have on your body? And more importantly, what can you do to uh, mitigate it and where can you get the help? That's what that campaign is gonna be focusing on. In the meantime, there is available support. So if you are not aware, this is a California initiative. It's called Cal Hope. And you can actually do live chatting and there's a warm line, there's resources. So if you have a, a patient or you come across someone or you yourself need resources, this is a, a wonderful resource that is free and available throughout California. So I didn't want to just give you information and not provide you with a resource. This is something that is available and online. And all of you, I hope, are aware that there is a 988 number for uh, suicide support, mental health support. You just dial 988 and you are, are tied into somebody uh, immediately. There is a component for perinatal mental support there. Um, HRSA has funded a national perinatal mental health um, line because 23% of all maternal deaths in California are due to suicide mental health issues. So up to one year, this is what the data is showing in California, after having a baby, 23% of the causes of death have to do with suicide and mental health. So this is a lot more common than what we think. So let me go into toxic ACEs and toxic stress. How many of you have ever heard of adverse childhood experiences? So some of you, not really, yes. Well, this is something that I is codified into um, my position as Surgeon General and one of the areas that the office focuses on. Unfortunately, this was a video that um, highlighted what it was and explained it. But basically what ACEs are, adverse childhood experiences, are things that we experienced growing up. And by that I mean, um, it, was there abuse? Was there neglect? 
Was there a difficulty in the household with the parents? Was maybe one parent uh, in prison? Was there uh, mental health issues? Was there divorce? Was there separation? So all of these things play a role in the development and the stress that a child has. We know that if the stress is constant and uh, recurrent over time, right, your, your body is in that flight or flight mode, it can actually add to a, a negative health outcomes. So the adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress is one of my initiatives. So how common are ACEs? So there's actually a screening test. The screening is, to, is you have a score of 10, and if you have a score of four or more, then you are considered to be at high risk for negative outcomes. You can see that the most common was substance abuse then physical abuse, uh, parental separation, sexual abuse. Now you may be thinking, well, so this is just having to do with pediatrics, right? This has nothing to do with me. I'm a neurologist, I'm, uh, I'm an internist. Well, actually, all of this study started out by an internal medicine doctor in San Diego, Dr. Filetti, and he was an internal medicine doctor that was focusing on an obesity clinic. And he kept on looking to see why is it that the patients are losing the weight, but these were 300 pound patients, 400 pound patients, and they would get down, they would lose 100 pounds and they would regain the weight. Why was it that they were regaining the weight? he stumbled by coincidence on the personal history of one of the patients when she said, you know, the weight actually helps protect me from men finding me attractive. And he said, well, when did this start? Because the woman was a normal birth weight, she was a normal weight toddler, but then about uh, when she was starting to get into elementary school, the weight started to go up. She said, when I was five years old, my father raped me. And ever since then, I started to eat food. And when I was overweight and obese, I would not be attractive to my father. And he, she shared, I told my sister, you need to eat and you need to protect yourself so that he won't come in and do the same thing with you. So this is, this is how this all came to be. And, and we realized, wow, okay. So could there be something else in terms of preventing uh, disease that starts early on in, in our lives? And this is what addressing adverse childhood experiences can potentially decrease. You can decrease depressive disorders by 44%. This is better than any medication if we stop to think about it. So prevention. Um, you can look at the, the other diseases, coronary heart disease by 13%. Look at current smoking, by, it decreases it by 33%. Heavy drinking, 24%. There's impacts also on social economic uh, challenges. So basically, if we address some of these issues early on in life, we can set folks up for a more positive trajectory for health overall. The toxic stress re response can disrupt the development of brain architecture and all many other organ systems and increase the risk for stress-related disease and cognitive impair impairment. And you can see here the immune system, hormones, nervous system, cellular changes, brain architecture, this is all of you, <laughs> heart, intestines, and kidney. So there is a direct correlation. So when we talk about treatment, let's look at the prevention. What can we do to prevent? Um, this was a study from Japan that highlighted that adverse childhood events are tied to dementia. There wasn't the, the data there, but this study actually um, show that it was. The dementia risk and protection really does begin in childhood. So really critically important to realize. And some of you, there, there weren't that many hands raised. Well, now I hope that I, I help introduce you to the prevention aspect of dementia. And this is for, for the scientists and for those of you who like the detail. This is really how the mechanism of action and the mechanism of action has to do with many times with epigenetic changes that can be um, uh, passed down to future generations. 
And we know that this happens. So when there is stress in the mom, there is stress and epigenetic changes that can be passed on to the, the baby and then that baby passes it on to, to their child. It's just a cascade. But if we can stop that stress, if we can buffer that stress, then we can mitigate the negative results. So ACEs dramatically increase the risk for eight out of the 10 leading causes of death in the US. And you can see number seven, Alzheimer's. It was the, if you had four or more ACEs, the risk was 11.2. So this is really critically important. So when we talk about prevention, here is one area that I, I invite you to learn more about and you know be some of those change agents and realize, well, well, all of this isn't working. And so oftentimes too, and I can tell you with my aunt, my cousins ask me, well, what can I do to prevent um, Alzheimer's in myself and in my children? So now I can say, well, let's do a nice screening. Maybe for you, we can help buffer some of the outcomes, but for her grandchildren, absolutely, we can, we can prevent uh, we can increase that buffering because there are things that are evidence-based that work and it's simple and some of the most simple thing is breathing <laughs> meditation realizing that um, changes really start from within and controlling our breathing right because if we let our our, our biology take over we're in that uh, fight or flight state constantly that cortisol level is what is is throwing things off. But if you learn how to meditate, that's one simple thing, and just bring yourself down, control that stress, it starts to um, improve the overall outcome. So I mentioned that I had overseen the Alzheimer's uh, program for California, and this was one of my big ahas. I thought, why are we not promoting this more? Again, people are always saying, what can I do to prevent Dementia, what can I do to prevent Alzheimer's? And when I saw this, I thought, whoa, this is public health. <laughs> this is decreasing smoking, decreasing depression, decreasing social addiction, increasing physical activity. We're uh, talking about air pollution, decreasing diabetes. All of these things decrease our modifiable risk factors for decreasing your risk for dementia. The other thing too that I have to highlight as um, a soccer player mom is the traumatic brain injury. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, why aren't we letting parents whose uh, kids are doing headers in soccer or whose kids are doing really risky behaviors and falling down off my mountain bikes because they're not wearing a helmet and having all of these TBIs to let them know you know, this could actually cause personality changes. These could actually cause neurological changes down the road. So this is an opportunity for medicine to talk with, with prevention and, and both, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm the ambassador between prevention and with direct patient uh, care. So I hope that you help me now um, spread the word and just realize, wow, we can focus on this, you know, talk to your internist and your primary care colleagues and let them know, you know, we can work together. And this is, these are the areas that data shows um, that this can be made a difference. And this is in the Lancet article. So for educator training in terms of trauma and stress, my office has been tasked to develop a, a program for educators, and it's not just teachers, it is also anyone who comes into contact with children. So it could be a coach, it could be um, a, a scout director, anyone that comes into contact with children just so that they know and they recognize what, why is this child um, acting out in class and screaming and not following directions? Is it really ADHD or is it something more? And when you start to ask, and look at the background, like what's happening at home, oftentimes that impacts the behavior in class and it has nothing to do with HD, ADHD. It has to do more with what is happening, you know, those ACEs that are happening at home. So it's gonna be a two hour module and it's gonna be broken up into three age groups and available in English and Spanish. So this is um, in the works and it should be available in June. 
So you may be thinking, wow, so much stuff is happening outside, right, of, of the, the clinic. When I'm, my patients are coming in to see me, they're just coming in to see me for that chief complaint for the Alzheimer's. But that is too short of a visit to be able to impact what's happening outside and just always remember that there are partnerships, there are collaboratives. Some of you who are working in the Alzheimer's group are working with community-based organizations because I worked with them, really helping to support that care caregiver. And remember that it's the social determinants of health that really are impacting the health of that patient a lot more than the care that we as physicians are oftentimes providing um, our patients. As much as we would like to think that we're making a difference, it's what's happening outside of our offices. We can give them the medication, but if they don't have the support at home to be able to give them the medication, to be able to support them, to be able to stimulate them, whatever recommendations you're giving them, it it's a mute point, right? So the social determinants of health, I just want to bring that public health piece in that, that makes a difference. So what is the cost for um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences? You can see in California, it's over $112 billion cost with um, depression being in there as well as all of the other comorbidities that increase the risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And uh, North America and Europe, we're talking now trillion and in there is an, uh, anxiety. So this is something that impacts all of us because it really is all of our investments, our tax dollars, uh, money that we are paying into the system and it would be great if we can help um, decrease that cost so we can invest that money in other um, resources for those of you who are interested in learning more about adverse childhood experiences, you can actually, and, and anybody can actually, once you go through the training, you can become an um, ACEs aware provider. And if you have, uh, if you take Medicare or Medi-Cal, you get reimbursed $29 uh, for doing the screening. So just be aware. And you can see the darker colors are where there has been more trainings that are happening. But this is online, it's free, I did it. It took me about an hour and a half. It's pretty straightforward. There's some interesting case studies um, focusing not just on pediatrics, but there was an internal medicine family practice. So just to make you aware. So if you want to learn more and get reimbursed of it, you know, that's where to go. And with that, I hope I have intrigued you and recruited you as ambassadors to help me for improving the health of, of Californians and more importantly, uh, address those adverse childhood experiences. You now know that that's one way that we can help prevent the mental health disorders as well as the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share and I hope you have an amazing conference. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the fantastic talk, Dr. Ramos. Okay, so, um, is there a question answer or no? Okay, so I think since we have a, a few more minutes, uh, for uh, do you have any uh, question for Dr. Ramos? Dr. Ramos. Okay, I have a question. So, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ramos, for a great presentation. Uh, in terms of the uh, direction of California uh, in, for the mental health and neurological disorders in general, uh, where do you see uh, we are going and uh, where, do you, where, where do you see we could help you? So I would say continue doing what you're doing and look into the ACEs, do the curriculum. It's very superficial, you know, like I said, I did it. But now when you see your patients, maybe start looking at it from a different angle. Um, 
probably for that patient, it may not make a difference, but it will help you understand. And you'll realize, wow, I didn't realize that this person um, grew up in the depression. And you know, the, the pieces just start to come together. But the most important thing, I think, will be the difference that you can, and the realization for the family members of that patient. And so that's where the prevention piece is, because as we're getting older, more of us are gonna be at risk for dementia, for Alzheimer's. And if we can start preventing and increase awareness, I think that would be the best partnership that I could ask, that realization. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk, first of all. And uh, you know, California does seem to usually be leading the way. I'm from the East Coast, and everybody else kind of gets dragged kicking and screaming. And uh, you know, but uh, how do we kind of educate people? Because I totally agree with you about you know stimulants being way over prescribed, uh, and uh, you know, the, just jumping to drug solutions and, you know, calling everything ADHD when it's all kinds of other things going on in the home and so forth. Um, so, I mean, how do you feel it's best to try to get that word out and change people's thinking on that? So that's where that $24 million campaign <laughs> that my office has been um, vetted to implement the, the media campaign comes into play. The beauty about media campaigns is that they can be accessed anywhere. So it can be replicated. It can, if you're from the East Coast, you don't have to be in California to pull the information. You can actually promote it within your own state. And so, as you said, you know, as California goes, so does the rest of the country. And I would not be surprised if we, can, we started to see that media campaign throughout the country. For the ACEs Aware, we actually have international people taking the uh, assessment. There are ACEs Aware meetings that are happening virtually. There is about 20% of the attendees are international. So this is something that is uh, really impressive. California has is, is really advanced in terms of implementing ACEs and um, coming up with solutions. We know that screening is not enough. We now have to come up with op operational uh, recommendations and solutions and behaviors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So no more questions for Dr. Ramos. Okay. So okay. So I'd like to actually introduce you to the next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Terence Williams. So um, is he there or? Oh, yes, okay. So uh, Dr. Williams is a professor and a chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at City of Hope in Diwarte. He has a National Institute of Health funded uh, research laboratory and has received numerous funding and awards from uh, National um, Cancer Institute, as well as American Society for Radiation Oncology, uh, American Society for Clinical Oncology, and American Cancer Society, as well as Radiologic Society of North America. He also serves as a permanent member of uh, the NIH Radiation Therapeutics and Biology Study Section. He's also served as a vice chair of American Society for Radiation Oncology Biology Scientific Programs and serves on numerous committees uh, for NRG Oncology and Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. Dr. Williams received his MD and PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and completed his residency in radiation oncology and internship in internal medicine at uh, University of Michigan Medical Center. And title of Dr. Williams' talk will be The Future of Radiation Therapy in Cancer. Well, thank you, Dr. Dr. Yamamoto, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you to the organizers, Babak, for the uh, opportunity to speak with uh, you guys here today. It's uh, certainly a tough act to follow, uh, following after Dr. Ramos. Um, I've been uh, here in Southern California for a couple of years now as chair of radiation oncology at City of Hope. Uh, we are the largest radiation oncology provider in Southern California uh, and now have a national program with the acquisition of our 
centers uh, in now Atlanta, Phoenix, and Chicago. So the job has become a lot busier since I, since I arrived. So I'm uh, just getting around that right now. But uh, if maybe if we could pull, pull, up, pull up the slides uh, that I have for the talk. Uh, I am going to obviously change uh, from what we just talked about, change gears. I'm sorry? They're, I think he, they're on the desktop of um, that gentleman. Yeah, we'll pull them up. They should be on the, uh, I just uh, uploaded them this morning with, uh, with you guys. Okay, all right, I will, uh, let me, uh, there, uh, they should be on the laptop right there. Uh, and right. No, okay, hold on, excuse me. <laughs> Okay, take two. Um, all right, so you know, uh, obviously, cancer. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of the different aspects from Dr. Ramos. That cancer is the number one, the number two disease uh, afflicting uh, uh, patients and, and cause of mortality. Uh, so um, we're going to change gears. We're going to talk about radiation therapy as it relates to cancer uh, treatment. Um, here are my disclosures. I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, some of the work we're doing with reflection, which is a, a way to deliver biologically guided radiation therapy. It's a new, new technology that's just come out over the last uh, year, really, and it was just FDA approved. So as you know, for cancer treatment, uh, three main pillars of, of how we, uh, we, get, we administer therapy, although there's also, actually, I'll mention there's surgery, radiation therapy, and then systemic therapy, the delivery of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Uh, for patients afflicted with this disease. Of course, there's also uh, uh, newer modalities that are, that are involved as well, nuclear medicine and radio radiology, interventional uh, uh, radiology as well for the treatment of cancer. But classically, those have been the, the, the three that have invo been involved in the treatment for many, many years. Now, what is radiation therapy? It's the single most common treatment modality we give to patients with cancer. About 50 to 60 percent of patients will at one time receive radiation for the, uh, during their course of treatment. And it consists of ionizing photons, charged particles, or heavy particles. I'll talk a little bit about protons and, and carbon today. And it's really, well, you know, it's the same kind of radiation you would get if you ever had an X-ray or a CT scan, but it's about 100 to 1,000 times more potent. And the target is typically DNA, okay, because the radiation induces double-strand breaks, which leads to cell death uh, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, or, or breakdown through senescence. And it's most commonly delivered as external beam radiation therapy, and we call, call that EBRT, but also as brachytherapy, which is the uh, uh, placement of radioactive sources within tissue, such as, for example, prostate cancer or gyneco gynecological cancers like uh, cervical endometrial cancer. And then there's also this burgeoning field of radiopharmaceuticals, which unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to talk about uh, today as well. And radiation is a curative mo modality in and of itself or in, used in combination with surgery uh, or systemic therapies. Now the history uh, steps back about a, over a little over 100 years now with uh, the discovery of x-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen uh, from Germany. And he ultimately won a Nobel Prize for that several years later in 19, uh, 1901. 
uh, after his discovery in 1895, it was already started to be used for cancer treatment within several years. Uh, and then the other uh, major figure, uh, so, so um, Dr. Rankin's up on the uh, top left, the other major figure is, is Marie Curie, who uh, from France, and she and her husband discovered uh, radium and radioactive isotopes. So these are uh, substances that are radioactive in and of themselves and can, can be administered to patients through uh, you know, catheters or other devices. And she, she, along with Henry Becquerel, won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for their work uh, and their, for their theory of radioactivity. And then she won another Nobel Prize uh, eight years later in chemistry uh, about for her discovery of radium and its applications in, in health uh, and medicine. And during the early 1900s, there was an explosion of the use of radiation therapy to treat not only cancer, but many other conditions because you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of treatments for many of these conditions back then. And because, uh, you know, it was, it was relatively simple. There was a lot of excitement around it. And we didn't know the long-term effects of the treatment itself. So uh, it was used to treat hair for hair removal, lupus, eczema, tuberculosis, uh, acne, even pneumonia. Uh, the gentleman on the, on the bottom right, you can see, is receiving radiation for his tuberculosis back then. And then that ended once that discovery of the long-term side effects of radiation came out uh, for, for cancers um, in, the, in, the, in the 1930s or so. Um, it, it, around the time of the 1940s to 1960s, with the, uh, the revolution in technology that was precipitated by World War uh, II, the development of linear accelerators came around. This was the way to sort of accelerate uh, photon or electrons into a target to produce X-rays through a machine uh, or electrons themselves. And th this is the, one of the first linear accelerators uh, at Stanford uh, treating a, a young patient with a retinoblastoma, the, um, actually the first patient with retinoblastoma treated by Dr. Henry, Henry Kaplan. And then uh, as technology evolved even more, we went from two-dimensional radiation therapy to just use you know, one beam from the front, one beam from the back, not really knowing the radiation doses that happened in between to 3D conformal radiation therapy where you are now using CT scans to effectively uh, uh, calculate the dose and make sure uh, we, we knew exactly what, what radiation dose we were giving to patients uh, using treatment fields. So as I mentioned, radiation in and of itself can cure cancer uh, alone as a single modality. We do that for pertinent to this group here, uh, brain tumors like low-grade brain tubers, uh, low-grade gliomas, uh, meningiomas, uh, prostate cancer uh, on the shown on the right, uh, lung cancer, uh, early stage cancer as you can show on the bottom, bottom right and many other cancers are listed there. In addition, uh, the ability to, to cure additional cancers through the addition of chemotherapy has extended our ability to uh, control tumors and, and survival in many patients. Again, high-grade uh, brain tumors shown in the upper right, an example of a, a grade three uh, anaplastic astro astrocytoma, uh, and on the bottom right, uh, locally advanced head and neck cancer and many of the other diseases you can see there. So the holy grail in our field is to, you know, because radiation is associated with toxicity, how do we minimize the toxicity to our patients and improve the, the therapeutic ratio and, and improve tumor control? Uh, that ratio between those two effects and those two curves you see on that graph, that blue and the red, is we want to try to widen that as much as possible. And the index is favorable, that therapeutic index is favorable, if the response of the tumor tissue is greater than the surrounding normal tissue. And there's different ways to do that. We have physical methods to improve our tumor targeting and, and avoiding normal tissue. I'm going to talk about uh, mr linac I'm going to talk about proton therapy. And then biologically, we can do that by altering fractionation, administering drugs which serve as radio protectors, drugs that... Uh, uh, you know, radio sensitizers to ultimately achieve a state in that with that green dotted line where you see that the tumor control, tumor response rate is quite high uh, for a given radiation dose, uh, but the risk of, of normal late toxicity or, uh, or normal tissue response in red is very low. So where are we right now with the delivery of radiation therapy? We've had a lot of advances over the last two days. I'm going to throw a lot of acro acronyms out there, uh, but starting off with image-guided radiation therapy. Okay, and then we're going to move into IMRT and, and some of those others listed there. Uh, Image-guided radiation therapy now allows us to more accurately make sure we're hitting the target, that tumor, in patients while they're on the treatment table. In the past, we had to use plain film x-rays to align the spine and then kind of use the spine as a surrogate for where the tumor was in the lung or the liver or wherever. Now we have uh, onboard mini CAT scans, essentially, that enable us to perform a mini CAT scan 
and be able to see the tumor well. This is the treatment plan in CT that happened a couple weeks before the patient uh, came onto the, ta the table for radiation treatment. Uh, and then you can see the actual uh, CAT scan while the patient's on the table, uh, which, you know, is, uh, close to the same type of resolution. And, and, and actually the technology is, is improving to the point where uh, we're very close to, um, uh, you know, having the same kind of resolution that we'd have with a diagnostic CT. Now, IMRT is a, is a treatment delivery uh, 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 technology that builds upon three-dimensional conformal radiation. And, and what it does is take each of the fields and divides them up into different beamlets of varying em energies. You can see there on the, on the top left, uh, these small five by five millimeter beamlets or, or one by one centimeter beamlets allow us to then shape the dose and give us lots of degrees of freedom to carve that dose around uh, nor uh, normal tissues we want to avoid the radiation with. On the bottom left is our traditional 3D co uh, conventional radiation therapy. On the right is IMRT. You can see the sparing of the spinal cord, sparing of the, of the vessels at front uh, that enables us to do that. And then how do we manage motion? This doesn't happen as much in, in the brain when we're treating brain because the, uh, obviously the cranial vault is pretty relatively stable on a table when we use mask to hold it down in a bite block, for instance. Uh, but in the other parts of the body, we have to struggle with motion in the, in the lungs and the abdomen. And so we're able to do that with, uh, for example, this system where you put a, a, a little block on the chest of the patient, uh, image it with an infrared camera, and then allow us to, uh, you know, treat the whole motion envelope of that tumor or to turn the beam on only when the tumor is in a certain position. It takes a little bit more work to do this, but it's doable. And then therefore reducing the, uh, the volume of tissue that we're irradiating. Now, pertinent to uh, our, our group here today uh, is the, the idea of stereotactic radiosurgery. This is using uh, high-dose radiation beams uh, to really hone down on a target with a single fraction of radiation and can be do done with frame-based or frameless systems. On the, on the right is a gamma knife uh, system that's used to commonly treat brain tumors. Uh, we use frameless system at the City of Hope. Um, and of course, this is a, a treatment that's been very effective um, uh, for treating uh, non-surgical cases uh, with very high rates of, of local control. Um, and it can tr treat both uh, brain tumors and, and, uh, that are primary or metastasized, as well as non-cancerous brain conditions like uh, arterial venous malformations or trigeminal neuralgia. You hit the, the nerve root with a lot of radiation you, and, and help with the pain. Uh, and so a lot of different applications in various diseases. Now, SBRT is stereotactic body radiation therapy. It's like doing SRS in another part of the body. Instead of the brain, you're now doing multiple fractions, let's say in the lung or the liver or the bones uh, or in somewhere in the pelvis, uh, and allows us, again, to deliver very high doses of radiation uh, conformally uh, and with IMRT uh, to spare normal structures. Here you can see the, uh, the dose bending around the spinal cord in this particular lung tumor treated with, uh, you know, an SBRT course, which is conventionally delivered in three to five fractions. So that's sort of where we've been in the past. Now where we're going in the future is to take a radiation therapy and use it because of our, our in, uh, technology that we've developed over the last hundred years uh, is to now be able to focally treat even patients with metastatic disease, which we wouldn't have thought of doing about 20 years ago. Um, uh, there's a number of studies uh, that I'm going to show that, that support that, that idea. But certainly we know that stage four disease, metastatic cancer, has survival rates that are much worse than early stage, stage one disease. You can see the disparities that exist in lung cancer, the 57% five-year survival for a stage one lung cancer compared to 5% five-year survival for stage four metastatic. A similar story in breast cancer, 99% versus 27%. So how do we bring those, those control rates in those early stage cancers to later stage disease? And so one of the ways in which radiation may be able to help with part of that is by helping to ablate metastatic disease. Um, this was a trial done on MD Anderson where a look into treat patients with oligometastatic disease, meaning few metastases, usually five or fewer uh, metastases uh, somewhere in the body. This, this, this study was done in lung cancer and showed that the addition of local therapy after chemotherapy, whether it was radiation or surgery, it was mostly radiation in this trial, uh, improved uh, um, overall survival, uh, doubled overall survival, and tripled, tripled our progression-free survival in patients. A very similar study was done at UT Southwestern, showed very similar findings that radiation, uh, SBRT, tripled median progression-free survival in, in lung cancer patients. And in this, what we call the Sabre Comet trial, was a basket trial 
not a huge trial, about 100 patients with different histologies, including breast, prostate, uh, lung, and um, G, uh, GI malignancies, again showed that the addition of radiation for patients with limited metastatic disease improved median survival. So taken together, this sort of tells us that for some cancers, uh, radiation may have a role in helping to quell or suppress uh, you know, metastatic disease, even, even, lead, even lead, helping to lead to long-term outcomes for certain, for certain types of patients. And this idea of complete meta metastatic ablation is being thrown out right now. So the idea of taking a, a patient with metastatic disease, being aggressive and going after, in certain instances where it's where safe to do so, the metastases, either through radiation or surgery or needle ablation or other local therapies, therefore leaving the micrometastatic disease left to systemic therapies that, that you know the, these other local therapies can't really address. And the idea behind this is you can use this to debulk tumors, leaving minimal residual disease behind for the, 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 the chemotherapy or immunotherapy to clean up. You can reduce tumor heterogeneity because tumors have lots of different biology going on with them, and some cells might be resistant to this chemotherapy, others might not. So that, that can help reduce that uh, tumor heterogeneity that leads to new metastatic disease. Uh, you can reduce the tumor growth pace uh, so, uh, and, and, and re reduce the spread of the disease. And, the, and perhaps one of the more exciting things which I'm about to talk about is the ability of radiation to prime the immune system to, to activate and, and start attacking the tumor. Okay? So that's the concept of radioimmunomodulation, this harness and radiation to, uh, to activate the immune system and attack the tumor cells. How is that done? So radiation has been shown as well as, as other modalities to, to uh, increase release of tumor antigens that then get picked up by um, uh, uh, antigen presenting cells, get uh, brought to the draining lymph nodes in the body, and then uh, activate ultimately T cells, which now go and traffic to the tumor and, and kill the tumors. And, and some of the pathways involve C-gas sting, interferon, um, it, it inflammatory pathways that look a lot like a viral state. And there was a lot of excitement when this case report came out in the New England Journal um, back uh, about almost 10 years ago now um, that uh, looked at a patient with metastatic melanoma who uh, was treated with an, a checkpoint inhibitor called ipilimumab, an anti-CTLA-4 drug. And this patient started to progress on therapy, had widespread metastatic disease. It was growing, had a tumor growing along the spine uh, in, uh, near the lung, and it was causing a lot of pain. So they treated that lesion with radiation. They decided, let's keep, the, let's keep the, the immunotherapy going for a little while. Let's give the radiation and go from there. Lo and behold, a month, three months later, all of a sudden, um, he, this patient had dramatic response to the immunotherapy and had a reduction in, in lesions that were not irradiated, for example, in the spleen or in the liver and many other sites. And there was, in, in the blood, there were signs that the, that the body had kicked in and started to develop an immune response against the tumor. So this, the bis, big, biggest success story we have so far with radio immunomodulation or a com combination of radiation and immunotherapy is in lung cancer. Uh, Dervalumab is, a, is an antibody that blocks a protein called PDL1 on the tumor cell. This PDL1 protein acts as a shield. It tells the tumor cell, don't eat, don't attack me. Uh, and so by using this antibody, you, you lower that shield and you allow the T cell now to, to recognize and, and, and attack the tumor. And in this trial of stage three lung cancer patients who were randomized to this Duralumab drug versus placebo, uh, we saw significant improvements in overall survival in the blue curve uh, versus the placebo in red uh, and, and progression-free survival. And it was really interesting about this study is that in a subset ex exploratory analysis, patients who um, started immunotherapy sh closer to the end of radiation therapy had better outcomes, suggesting that a, a tumor inflamed state from the radiation uh, and the chemotherapy could, could uh, uh, you know, invoke, invoke this immune response. Unfortunately, we've struggled uh, with uh, gliomas, uh, and um, we, there's been a number of trials combining uh, PDL1 or PD1 drugs or CTLA4 drugs in combination with tem temozolomide radiation for brain cancer, and there's been really no signal there, uh, not much, uh, except in perhaps uh, some uh, mismatch repair uh, uh, or patients with uh, microsatellite and stable uh, disease. And now switching gears to a, a different type of technology, uh, uh, particle therapy with uh, protons, for example, and carbon ion therapy. Uh, this is very exciting, exciting technology for sure, but also very expensive technology. Uh, and let me explain the rationale a little bit behind it. 
So protons, um, essentially, uh, you, you sort of dial the energy of the proton that you want, and as soon as that proton reaches the end of its energy as it passes through tissue, through the body, it, it has this, um, I don't know if I can point it out here, um, uh, that you can see that red curve, it deposits a lot of energy at the, at, at, the, at the end of its track, and then rapid dose fall off at the end. Whereas the blue curve is the photon x-rays, which are, go through and, are treatment through and through, and, and it's really hard to stop uh, uh, photons. They just, they just keep going. So they deposit a lot of dose beyond, uh, beyond the target. So you can see the difference in, on the right. Uh, the best way to look at it is in the, on, on the spine treatment on the bottom. The photons is on the right. We're treating with a beam through the spine from the back of the patient. You see all that, that yellow, blue, and green dose in the front of the patient, and this is a pediatric patient, um, where, whereas the protons, because you dial the energy down, you say, I want you to end right there. Uh, you see a steep dose fall off and essentially no radiation dose to the front of the patient. So exciting technology will allow us to spare uh, uh, a lot of radiation dose, especially to pediatric patients. Has a lot of applications in brain uh, uh, malignancy for sure uh, and in skull-based tumors. Uh, and um, in the setting of re-irradiation, it'll be very useful to spare integral radiation dose to the organs. Here's another example of protons treating uh, an esophageal cancer on, on the left. You can see the significant sparing of the heart and, and liver uh, compared to on the right, where you have a lot of dose to the heart and liver and other, and other organs. So we're still trying to generate the, the data to really understand if this, if this treatment modality is, is, is worth the extra investment. Um, I will mention also that there's, you know, the carbon centers on the right, you can see that uh, uh, there's no carbon centers right now in the United States, um, but there is being one built in Florida, but there's now carbon centers in Japan and um, in other parts of the world. Uh, carbon has the advantage of potentially being more radiobiology effective because of its higher, it's a heavier ion, it's, it's uh, more linear energy transfer in its track, so theoretically it could be better for radioresistant histologies. In terms of, of proton therapy in the United States, there's about 40 centers across uh, the country, or the closest one to here is in Loma Linda. Uh, there's also one in San Diego. The one in San Diego is in the top right. It's uh, the Scripps California Proton Center. Uh, and, it, and, and when initially these centers were built, many of them were these large centers with four or five rooms, okay? The cost, the financial burden of protons has now shifted our gears to, to really focus on smaller uh, establishments, maybe one or, one or two room uh, types of facilities, and then actually in just Astro this past fall, uh, Mevian, a proton vendor, announced a, 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 solu a proton solution that can be uh, delivered in the, in, the, in the same room as a standard linear accelerator. So certainly the technology is improving and evolving. Now flash radiation therapy is a brand new uh, type of radiation, but this is really not a type of radiation so much as the way we deliver the radiation. So typically radiation is delivered for a patient over several minutes. Flash radiation has the ability to give all the radiation within one second uh, while the patient's on the treatment table. Ultra fast, uh, and, and, the re and the reason we think this might be more beneficial is because there's a lot of preclinical studies that have shown that if you deliver the radiation ultra fast like this, you can reduce the normal tissue's reaction, bad reaction to the radiation. For example, this preclinical tissue uh, studies in lung and brain show that there's less fibrosis in the lung, less damage to the brain tissue, so uh, enhanced memory recall after radiation in, in preclinical studies. And so therefore, we believe this it has the potential to revolutionize the field of radiation uh, oncology and radiation therapy. Here's more studies uh, in a mini pig showing uh, reduced uh, um, skin toxicity from flash radiation versus our conventional dose rate radiation. Uh, here's a cat treated with uh, 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 flash radiation here. And we now have our first trial uh, of patients treated with um, flash radiation. This was done actually at the Proton Center at the University of Cincinnati, and they, they just reported their results in JAMA Oncology. Treated 10 patients with an 8 gray single fraction using pencil scanning a proton beam and showed 50% complete response to pain and 67 partial response to pain. So lots more to come on this. Oh, I just want to make you aware of it, uh, that this is coming down the road and you'll hear about it more often. Uh, so aside from protons and carbons, there's also a newer technology that's evolved over the last 10 years called MR-guided radiation therapy. This is obviously using an MRI married to a linear accelerator. <clears throat> and it takes advantage of the ability of the MR, MRI to use soft tissue delineation really well, which has a lot of, it's very superior 
in some sense to CT-based uh, localization. In addition, some of these devices, there's actually three vendors out there right now, can manage motion very, very well. Um, and on top of it, what's really unique about this is while the patient's on the treatment table and you're treating, let's say, um, something in the head and neck or, or, or in, the, in the lungs or the uh, abdomen, if the tumor on one day is, you know, when you originally planned the case, if that tumor is now moved closer to the intestines or to another uh, a structure, a, a spinal cord or something, you have the ability to adapt the, the treatment while the patient's on the table, create a new radiation plan uh, within a half an hour and then, and then deliver that fraction. So it's uh, certainly revolutionized in our, our field and we're seeing some uh, excellent results with it so far. Here's a, some images showing the, the ability to see, for example, a pancreatic tumor on the right with the MR uh, and, and versus the cone beam uh, CTs on the left. It's really hard to see. And then I mentioned the motion management uh, capabilities. Uh, I don't know if we can play the movie on the left um, just to show that. I, I can't click on the, uh, to activate the movie. Um, and then you can see on the right, uh, the sculpting of radiation dose uh, that happens uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's actually a pancreatic tumor, and then around it on both sides, you can see it's kind of like uh, a concave, uh, uh, you know, concave distribution uh, of the, uh, the two lesions, uh, which I, the, the intestines on the right and left. So there you can see that on the left now the movie plane of the tracking of the pancreatic tumor uh, while the patient's on the, on the treatment table, and, and then turning the beam on only when that tumor is in the right position. Uh, and then I'll go on to the next slide here. All right. Uh, slide got cut off a little bit there, but the next uh, advance I'm going to touch about briefly is the biologically guided radiation therapy and molecular imaging. <clears throat> BGRT is a new, newer than MR Linac, newer than proton carbon, but we've been doing it in, uh, in, for, in, for a long time in the sense that what I meant to say is that real-time BGRT is new, but we've always been using PET to delineate tumors in radiation oncology because it provides biological information about, about the tumor. Uh, the conventional PET is an FDG, uh, F18 glucose-based, obviously, uh, a PET scan, and has been done very well in helping us to delineate tumors better. So this is an example of a patient with lung cancer where we, we didn't know where the, where the tumor was in the lymph nodes as well as we did with PET. So the, the red are the targets uh, de delineated by a CT scan, and the PET uh, finds additional disease in, in, the, in the chest, as you can see by those additional purple lymph nodes. And in studies that have looked at PET-based planning versus no PET-based no pet planning, uh, we've seen improvements in overall survival for various diseases, as shown on the right. Now we're taking PET and using intra-treatment PET to, for, as response adaptation to improve outcomes. So let's say a, a patient's getting a six-week course of radiation for their, for their lung cancer, or their cervical cancer, or head and neck cancer. Um, we can do a PET intra-treatment uh, use the information from the PET and decide if they're not responding well, let's dose escalate them. This was a trial done in CRT, CRTOG 1601 that randomized patients to 60 gray and 30 fractions, the standard dose and versus this PET-based adaptive dose, and they went up to an additional 70, uh, like a total of 70, 74 gray. And they showed that that boost, the adaptive boost, improved local control, d uh, disease-free survival, and actually overall survival in patients without any uh, significant increase in toxicity. Um, there's other molecular imaging tools out there as well. For example, um, PSMA. PSMA is a, a, a prostate cancer-specific marker that uh, can highlight, highlight prostate very well, uh, cells well, and is, is very correlated with Gleason stage. And there's a number of different radio tracers out there from Lanthius, it's a, a 18 fpyl or Telex, which has a, a PSMA-11. They both bind to the PSMA uh, uh, protein on the surface of prostate cancer cells and can very well find the disease throughout the body and are, 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 we're shifting from using FDG PET to using this PSMA PETs in this disease. And you can see on the right how well that in some, in some instances where a patient with lots of bone metastasis for prostate cancer that are on hormonal therapy, some of them may not be very active. So doing well, you don't have to treat all of them, but for maybe the uh, ones that are not responding well, like this lesion on the, on the, with the yellow arrow to the, to the hormonal therapy, you can now deliver radiation or, or some kind of ultrasound focal ablation or, or needle ablation to, um, to target that tumor. Similar um, uh, radio tracers are coming out for other diseases. Breast cancer has uh, FES, which is uh, fluoro uh, uh, beta estradiol. That is specific for breast cancer cells. 
And uh, FAPI, or FAP, is fibroblast activated uh, protein, which is an exciting new uh, radio tracer uh, because, and this is applicable to brain tumors, because many tumors have cancer-associated fibroblasts. Um, and, uh, and you know, this, these cancer-associated fibroblasts bind the, uh, uh, this uh, FAP uh, protein or, or inhibitors of this protein. So you can take these inhibitors, tag them with radiation therapy, inject them into patients, they home to where the tumors are, and you can see them quite well. This on the right is an example of FAPI PET and many different tumor types. This was the image of the year in 2019 from the Society of Nuclear Medicine Imaging, and um, it has been, is generating a lot of excitement in the field. So, you know, where we see the field going for BGRT is to take different types of tumors and use the right um, radio tracer to guide our radiation to treat those tumors. So, for example, in brain, gliomas have a lot of uh, uptake of FAP. We could use FAP to treat those. Similarly, head and neck, lung, liver, uh, pancreas, GI cancers, all use in FAP. Breast cancer, we might use FES. Prostate cancer, we might use PSMA. So we, we can ultimately be more specific and, and more sensitive in our radiation to find the cancer that exists in the body. I don't have a lot of time left, um, but wanted to touch briefly on um, radiogenomics and molecular biomarkers. Uh, there's so many potential uh, biomarkers out there. This is a review that we published recently looking at tumor DNA markers, blood-based DNA markers, gut microbiome, IHC, tissue-based markers, right? Uh, and, and there's a lot of emerging data that um, genomic mutations may be associated with radiation resistance. This is uh, data from rectal cancer uh, for KRAS mutations and data from um, lung cancer and liver cancer treatment with SBRT, all showing that... Uh, KRAS mutations are associated with worse outcomes. There's similar data for BRAF mutations. That's some of my lab's work, uh, my group's work, as, and there's NERF2 mutations um, uh, uh, with the group from Stanford. Um, I'll skip over that. But also, aside from DNA profiling, there's RNA profiling. Um, and, and, and so uh, RNA profiling is used a lot now in, in, in diseases like prostate cancer with a decipher and portos uh, molecular test to predict whether a patient needs radiation. Um, but also in breast cancer, there's, there's new um, RNA signatures that can decide whether patients need radiation. So in, in lung cancer, for example, we took this, uh, it took about 100 patients who had been treated for SBRT with lung cancer, and we looked at PI3 kinase AKT activation, which is known to promote radiation resistance downstream of RAS, and showed that patients with high PI3 kinase uh, activation had worse uh, outcomes uh, um, with, with radiation. So it may be that th these sort of tools will help us decide okay, radiation is not the best for, for every single patient. You know, maybe, maybe have it surgically removed or maybe have needle ablation as, as other uh, opportunities to better personalize our therapies. This uh, radio sensitivity index uh, is perhaps the best known right now um, pan-cancer um, uh, RNA tool to assess uh, radio sensitivity. It was developed by a colleague of mine, Javier Torres Roca in, from Florida, from Moffitt, and looked at um, uh, the RNA transcriptome, came out with 10 genes that predicted radiation response, showed that in a rectal esophageal cancer, head and neck cancer, correlated well with outcomes, uh, and ultimately took thousands of patients through a bioinformatics analysis, took this RSI index, this radio sensitivity index, and developed this genomic-adjusted radiation dose. And I just want to point out um, that we've classically always thought that glioblastoma was radio-resistant based on our clinical suspicions, but this also confirms that as well, because as you can see in the red circle, gliomas are one of the, uh, are the most radio-resistant uh, uh, tumor that we treat in the 60 gray category. <clears throat> Lastly, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the cancer moonshot. Uh, that this, is a, this is an opportunity for many of us uh, to uh, advance uh, cancer research and move forward. Of course, the cancer moonshot, I'm sure you are aware, was uh, funded through the uh, 21st Century Act, uh, um, uh, Century Cures Act in 2016 and with an appropriation of $1.8 billion, really seeking to de democratize cancer care, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and supportive care. And the initial goals were really to move scientific discovery along very quickly, foster collaborations, and improve the sharing of cancer data. And then the Biden administration just recently released their new goals uh, and a lofty goal of decrease in today's age-adjusted death rate from cancer by at least 50% within 25 years and improve the experience of, of people and their families living with and surviving cancer. And they've, they've set, set up seven priorities for, in which to do so. <clears throat> Diagnose cancer sooner. 
prevent cancer, address inequities, target the right treatments to the right patient through personalization, uh, speed progress through new therapies, uh, support patients, caregivers, and survivors through the experience, and then learn from all patients. So at City of Hope, we're trying uh, many ways to align ourselves to uh, those, those different priorities. Uh, diagnosing cancer sooner, we're, we're doing, using early detection, expanded cancer screening, for example, on lung and breast colorectal, liquid biopsy techniques, you'll probably hear about that during the conference, um, preventing cancer through germline testing, smoke and cessation, and addressing inequities uh, through our efforts at City of Hope, leading legislative uh, efforts to advance ca cancer care equity by helping to get access to underserved patients uh, and ethnic groups. And then our, some of our measures towards uh, targeting um, uh, the right patient to the right, uh, the right treatment to the right patient is through uh, precision medicine-based approach to DNA and RNA profiling of patients, biomarker development, radiomics. I didn't have time to talk about radiomics today is another uh, really exciting field. Uh, and then in terms of our therapies at City of Hope, cellular therapies, oncolytic viruses, trying to again uh, move the needle forward in some of our very uh, deadly diseases like GBM, pancreas cancer, and certain lymphomas. And then um, in terms of supportive care, how can we advance survivorship? How can we improve the area of research? Uh, maybe you know, wrap around those services around the patient completely. And then from the aspect of how do we learn from all of our patients, we have a division of population sciences that's very focused on integrating large data, thousands and thousands of patients to make new discoveries there. So in conclusion, Radiation therapy is a highly technical treatment employing physics, dosimetry, motion management, advanced imaging to deliver precise radiation therapy to our patients with cancer and without cancer. And uh, we think the future is bright right now. Lots of different new technologies on the horizon, um, expanding radiation therapy to metastatic disease, particle therapy, flash uh, therapy, uh, MR, MR guided radiation therapy, biologically guided radiation therapy, immunomodulation, I didn't get a chance to talk too much about theranostics and radiopharmaceuticals or, or, or radiomics, but also molecular biomarkers, as I mentioned, are really lots of opportunity in, the field, in our field. But what's so critical is that we continue to collaborate with other disciplines, um, because that's how we've made a lot of our progress. Uh, working with medical oncology, surgery, uh, hematology, nuclear medicine, interventional radiology to speed these discoveries together for the patient and for the, for the betterment of uh, uh, cancer care. And lastly, the Cancer Moonshot represents an opportunity for all of us uh, to partner together and make rapid discoveries to, uh, to fuel advances that will ultimately save uh, lives and improve the quality of life. And that's another completely whole other area I really didn't touch upon, quality of life, and that's so critically important. I've talked a lot about advance in therapy, but you have to think about the quality of life side of things. And, and, and uh, you know, I think uh, the founder of City of Hope, uh, you know, said it the best when he said, uh, there is really no profit in curing the body if in the process we destroy the soul, uh, which again speaks to that, uh, the whole patient. So these are my um, funding sources on the left, uh, some of the collaborators on my right at the Ohio State University, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, uh, members of my lab and my, my collaborative research groups. Uh, thank you for your time uh, and look forward to discussing more with all of you at the conference. Any question for Dr. Williams? I'm Peter Winkler from Munich, before Germany, and, uh, and before I was Germany in Salzburg, Austria. And I spent in my life in Sweden, Karolinska Schuhküse, when Gamma Knife was developed under Ladislaus Steiner and my friends from Sweden. And I am, was yeah, a little... Yeah, the adventures of, uh, of uh, you know, SRS, really. Yeah. I was a little bit wondering that you didn't mention the combination of surgery and radiotherapy. Yes. This case with a huge temporal tumor, I would not leave for radiotherapy. Absolutely. I would operate the big one, even two. And I did it the last 15, 20 years when I was still active uh, chairman. Now I retired one a couple of months ago remove the big one and leave just in, in, in anticipation with the radiotherapist. You yep. do a great job. I congratulate you for your fantastic presentation. Also the future you showed us. 
but we need a combination from the beginning to see yeah. the whole individual patient. And the big one Absolutely. with the perifocal, with the peritumor edema, edema, I would not recommend to just perform radiotherapy because one night the patient comes with a huge edema, with epilepsy, crisis, etc. Et so Do you agree with this? Or I agree, I agree. Yeah. Maybe this patient refused the therapy. It's also possible sometimes, yeah? But we should combine our, yeah. what we can do. And we can do a neurosurgery today. We will have our lectures maybe too late on Sunday. Nobody will be there more, I see here in the auditorium. But we could discuss this. We should chat in advance. We have to combine our strengthness yeah. and our power. You agree with this? I agree 100%. You know, Thank so you. In brain cancer, uh, surgery is so critical, right? Uh, and, and, and we talk about high-grade gliomas that are, that are resistant to radiation. There's, there's you know, no question, uh, lots of data supporting that uh, removal as much surgery as po uh, of the tumor as possible through surgery is the number one uh, treatment, uh, uh, right? And then given adjuvant or post-operative um, uh, Chemotherapy and radiation is, 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 is the second part of that therapy, no, no question. Um, you know, for radio-resistant histologies, I mean, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't cure, uh, you know, a, 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 grade, a grade three anaplastic without, without surgery, right? Um, so it's going to take that multidisciplinary discussion to decide, okay, well, you know, now, we're, now in, brain, in, in the area of brain meds, there's this, um, a movement towards uh, doing preoperative radiation. Uh, and, and why that might be more beneficial. So it's really going to take a multidisciplinary discussion um, with the surgeons to, to, to figure out when, when are we going to give radiation in relation to surgery, before or after. Uh, but no question, um, that's, that's critical. And, and, and the, the concepts you posed about edema, uh, swelling, uh, neurological dysfunction at the time of presentation, all that has to be factored in that I just didn't have time to really talk about. Thank you. Hi, Chris Wheeler, uh, Brain Mapping Foundation, T Neuropharma, and Stimvax Therapeutics. Um, thanks for your your comprehensive talk. It was fascinating. Um, I'm a longtime immunotherapist in the, the brain cancer space, and almost 20 years ago now, we published uh, the first report that immunotherapy actually sensitizes to uh, chemotherapy in glioblastoma yeah. patients, um, and that has important implications for not just immunotherapy, uh, but general immune health prior to, to conventional treatment. Is there any evidence for that kind of sensitization uh, uh, in, uh, between immunotherapy and, and radiotherapy? B between immunotherapy and radiation therapy? Yeah, in that direction, not necessarily radiotherapy sensitizing immunotherapy, but the other way around. Yeah, I think... Um one of the problems with, with radiation and toxicity is that it, it you know, um, lymphoid cells are very radiosensitive. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have to be careful about and le need to learn more about how to sequence immunotherapy with radiation in relation. Because if, you know, if you're, you're bringing in T cells into the tumor with immunotherapy like immune checkpoint inhibitors and then clearing them out with radiation, that's <laughs> that might not be the best approach. Although. Right. We've been seeing some encouraging signs of patients who, who get immunotherapy first, then go on to chemoradiation or radiation, and then go on to ad additional uh, immunotherapy after that. And there's been some preclinical studies supporting that combination as well. So I think yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. It, it would work. I think it works both ways. Certainly, uh, the data is also there for chemotherapy uh, as a way to release and prime the immune system to uh, immune, uh, you know, immune therapies. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so, when you were talking about biomarkers and using um, hematology, hematology in order to address that, wouldn't that be something that we're, how far along are we on accepting epigenetics with hematology, with using biomarkers and looking at the RNA platform to help then guide that more uh, medicine precision or evidence-informed type of treatment, making it more individual for that person? Meaning that, is there a way to identify the um, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, types of therapies to guide us before we actually do them by using biomarkers? Yeah, great question. Uh, there's a lot of research in this field, um, yeah, certainly in, in more so in systemic therapy, chemotherapy, than there is in radiation. That's, you know, I would say we're, 
we're much further behind our medical oncology colleagues in, in, in using molecular biomarkers to select systemic therapies. For example, oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors in lung, uh, lung cancer target an EGFR uh, or, or ALK, muta uh, ALK mutations. Uh, those are the kinds of, you know, we, we were matching the right therapy to the mutation in a, in a tumor for a patient with uh, metastatic disease in those instances. Lung cancer is not the only example. Many other diseases uh, in which we're doing that. In, 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 in brain cancers, GBM, for example, uh, BRAF mutation can be treated with combination BRAF and MEK inhibitor. Um, so um, we're, we're moving along in the field um, in, in general. Uh, certainly with systemic therapies, we've done very well. Radiation, um, we, we have not quite clinically implemented a lot of what I've, I've shown you or talked about today, except in, 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 in prostate cancer uh, and, and, and breast cancer right now. Um, where, uh, you know, in, in, in GBM, certainly we, 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 you know, we consider methylation uh, status. Uh, we, we, can, we look at IDH status, et cetera. Um, but in terms of deciding whether or not a patient actually does or does not get radiation um, or gets dose-escalated radiation, we're still trying to solidify the evidence to use in biomarkers, whether they're in tissue biomarkers or in blood-based biomarkers, or ultimately for selection of radiation therapy. We're getting close. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Williams. Um, should I start, I guess? The So I actually will start uh, my portion of the talk, which is a presidential report. Uh, we are I was supposed to actually give this talk uh, earlier uh, before the keynotes, but since uh, we had a little bit of technical issues and then we didn't have enough uh, audience, so we just, uh, I just decided to actually uh, have this talk uh, now. So I know that uh, general session will start at 10 o'clock, um, so I will actually really be quick. Um, so the purpose of this talk is to just to briefly go over uh, what has been done for the past one year uh, during my presidency. This is actually the first time that uh, uh, we give a presidential report uh, here in this Congress. Okay, so uh, let's see. Have, um, go to the next one. So uh, this is going to be the, my overview of the updates. Uh, I'll be talking about those five points mainly. And I'm gonna start with the first uh, general uh, CMT uh, updates. So for regards to uh, our scientific track, as you can see from our program, uh, we have a, a total of a nine um, scientific track uh, this year. So uh, what we normally do is that we each uh, track, we normally uh, is organized by um, several co-chairs. And co-chairs, usually the job is to try to build the sessions with some unique topics, which are uh, also chaired by two session chairs. And we fairly, for those who are in the uh, subcommittee, we all know that we fairly regularly meet um, and uh, with a, a kind of help from our dedicated fellows and interests and volunteers, uh, we normally have our virtual uh, meeting or uh, conference call to make this happen. And um, so, but the one thing I would like to say, and also Dr. Babak uh, Katev actually earlier mentioned that uh, we consider this annual Congress as just not just uh, like a, um, to disseminate uh, all this new knowledge and new data, but then um, instead uh, our ultimate goals are to first uh, collaborate uh, with our colleagues within or outside of the track, and we hope that uh, this will allow us to initiate a new project um, uh, or involve in a, a part of our, our initiative that we have uh, within our organization and uh, think of this uh, as a think tank and publication and uh, more. So um, so just like I give an example, uh, because I'm actually in charge of a, a neuro-oncology track with Dr. Um, Reinhard Schulte. I think he's, I hope that he's in the audience. Oh yeah, I think he's here. 
So I just wanted to show uh, some success story from our track. So first, uh, this actually neuron oncology session, uh, before it was uh, just a session, uh, which uh, Dr. Reinhardt, Shote, and I actually uh, you know, first organized back in about 2010. We just had only one or two sessions in a meeting, but then now, uh, more than 10 years later, we have our own track. Uh, now this year, we are now even expanded into all four days uh, in 12 sessions. Very successful. And for the past, again, you know, two years, um, just only uh, two years, uh, we had one session called uh, Alternating Electric Fields uh, Session. Um, so at the time, we had uh, five different speakers ranging from, uh, which coming from all the different backgrounds, from biologists to uh, physicists to medical uh, engineers. Um, and we find out that we have a common goal, although we are coming from all different backgrounds. So we decided to have a, another, you know, our dedicated project. And then what happened is that after two years, only short two years, we actually uh, started to formulate our own project. And uh, we also ended up in uh, having a, uh, at least a couple of publications, including a review articles, as well as a, um, um, uh, what do you call that, um, a poster, um, as an abstract uh, presentation. So we are very successful um, when it comes to uh, organizing uh, as a track. And I really hope that uh, um, uh, each of you who are involved in it, this track will have some, uh, find some kind of opportunity like this not only to share the old and, you know, new data, but then I hope that uh, all the um, conference, after the conference, you are able to form some sort of uh, uh, collaboration with uh, our colleagues. So uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, so many um, uh, tracks. As you can see from our website, we have uh, nine different tracks. And um, so if you um, would like to know more about the tracks, uh, you can actually uh, scan this QR code uh, in the, uh, Left hand corner, so that that will directly go to the program page, and then in this way you can actually uh, download uh, all the uh, nine different tracks uh, PDF program. So the next one it will be about the membership. So we are indeed uh, over the 20 years of this conference, we are expanding our members, and uh, not only in the United States but worldwide. But then uh, we also wish to actually increase a little bit more of a paid membership. And this is actually really crucial to sustain ourselves as an organization. So if possible, um, uh, even if the speaker, I would like you to become uh, you know, uh, official member of a society. And in fact, that uh, from a couple of years ago, all the board members are actually required to be uh, a paid a member in order to stay as a board. And then uh, from this year, we expect that uh, all the subcommittee chairs also now require to become members. So I do really encourage everyone to become a member if possible. So I uh, will talk uh, uh, briefly about uh, what we have done in terms of initiatives and policies and you know, legislature uh, uh, activities. So what we accomplished. So, um, so we actually involve a lot heavily uh, in when it comes to policy change and implement uh, changes when it comes to a veterans' health as well as opioid addiction, mental health, suicide prevention, and the cancer. So in the past one year, uh, we actually uh, actually uh, did a lot of uh, activity to uh, um, implement some of those uh, initiatives and uh, advise uh, uh, even our White House uh, when it comes to um, uh, about um, how to uh, make a better uh, treatment or better prevention when it comes to men, um, improving a mental health as well as opioid addiction and veterans issue and, and cancer um, as well. Um, also, um, so one of our strengths in uh, being in our organization as an active member is that we have a lot of opportunity to uh, publish as a group. So in the past uh, two years, for instance, we have five publications back in 2021, and we had five more publications in 2022. And we still have a multiple manuscript which are still under uh, you know, preparation or either uh, submitted and under review. And we always uh, pay attention to, the, of course, the quality of a you know, paper, but the quality of a journal that we are going to submit. So we normally only submit the journal which are archived only in uh, PubMed. 
And we also, uh, also have a um, special issue in a couple of uh, um, uh, well-known journals, including Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and as well as the Journal of uh, Personalized Medicine from MDPI. And of course, uh, also our fellows, especially for fellows and as interns, uh, all played a big role in uh, writing those uh, papers. Therefore, they're going to have also the publication record. So that's a, a good perk of being uh, fellows and uh, interns for our organization. And we also have uh, two new uh, books, uh, which uh, we're still working on a different level. So in the past, uh, we had uh, uh, two textbooks. Uh, one is a nano uh, a neuroscience and nano uh, neurosurgery textbook, and another one is uh, neurophotonics and brain mapping. Uh, so now, uh, uh, hopefully in next year, uh, or this year or next year, uh, we will be able to publish a second edition of both textbooks. So um, I think we are already filled with the speak. Uh, all the writers, but I think we may probably have some opening in a book chapter, so if you're interested in uh, contributing to some of those uh, book chapters, do please uh, um, let us know. So about the website, um, so currently uh, maybe uh, many of you might probably have visited our website, uh, so this is actually the current website. Um, so we definitely uh, uh, also thought that we need to improve and update our, our website, so which we are actually on the process of uh, changing our website soon. So hopefully after this meeting, we will be uh, able to uh, actually introduce you with a, a new website with a, a better contents and then um, um, it's easier to maneuver uh, this um, uh, website. And also, um, since we have a lot of things to um, um, actually uh, brag about our achievement, uh, it's really important to have also some kind of a media uh, exposure as, as well as uh, some of those uh, uh, social media platform. And uh, indeed, we do have a, a brain mapping TV, which actually show some of our work and uh, uh, interviews by the members posted in our website. And we do also have uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, uh, LinkedIn, um, as well as also uh, Instagram as well. And we uh, hope to uh, actually add more contents in uh, our uh, Brain Mapping TV and also as uh, social media platforms. And uh, we also try to pay attention to have a more, uh, a more and a shorter uh, actually uh, you know, uh, programs. Because these days I noticed that a lot of people have a shorter and a shorter uh, attention. <laughs> So before YouTube, they have a 30 minutes, 60 minutes, uh, you know, content. But then I know that a lot of people these days watch uh, Instagram with uh, only one minute or five minutes, shorter one. And then now we have uh, uh, what uh, TikTok, which is like only 50 seconds. So our attention becomes shorter and shorter, even like maybe attention of uh, milliseconds or <laughs> nanoseconds. So we know we are aware of that, and then we hope to uh, actually um, listen to our, your suggestions and then going to have a more uh, better effective uh, uh, media uh, exposure so, so in the next uh, category uh, quickly I would like to inter uh, uh, introduce you with the uh, brain uh, uh, technology and innovation park or BTIP initiative uh, updates so um, so BTIP uh, progress report so we have a, a pretty long uh, um, uh, description of what the BTIP is all about. But then a uh, very important thing is actually is that uh, BTIP is uh, our initiative will be there. First of all, uh, uh, most important goal for us will be to try to fast track the development of a better and effective treatment for neurological disorders. That's the main goal. And also two other important goals for BTIP uh, or Brain Technology Park will be to uh, try to democratize the most uh, effective cost efficient treatment uh, for the general public and as well as to uh, try to actually uh, uh, increase the uh, you know uh, the job opening so job market so those are the most important uh, aim for us uh, for the BTEP and um, so as a progress wise we are still on the process of uh, finding or finalizing uh, to secure uh, space uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, good um, candidate space so hopefully uh, by uh, uh, soon we will be able to uh, get the uh, um, 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 announce uh, our candidate space soon oh, oh okay okay, <laughs> okay thank you okay great, great, thank you 
So for an uh, overview about the uh, uh, Neuroscience 20, so Probably this is a better way. Thank you. So for uh, Neuroscience 20, um, so basically uh, our goal is to try to build a, a, a global consortia of a brain initiative uh, across uh, the uh, globe, um, actually the G20 nation and beyond. So uh, our goal for uh, N20 or Neuroscience 20 would be to try to publish uh, um, essentially the white paper on, on, especially on the cost of uh, neurological disorders worldwide, and draft and also submit a uh, communique uh, to the health minister of the host nations. So, um, so for now, we actually started this uh, neuroscience 20 back in 2014. So this year, uh, last year's was actually our ninth year. Um, and we had a really uh, successful N20 uh, summit in Bali, India, uh, Indonesia in back in 2000, uh, or last year. So this year, uh, we are very excited that we're going to, uh, we are planning to hold uh, this uh, N20 uh, event uh, in uh, India. And uh, pro uh, we are still actually working on the program, so we hope to uh, finalize our speakers and all the detailed programs and venue pretty soon. So we hope that uh, if you're interested uh, in joining N20, uh, please let us know. And also another one uh, more item that I would like to actually emphasize is called uh, GPS or Global Physicians and Scientists uh, Initiative. So um, this concept or idea of a GPS initiative was not really new. Uh, we had actually this concept for a while, but then this is the, uh, last year is the year that we officially launched this program uh, due to the uh, fact that uh, uh, there was a actually a very sad event uh, happening in uh, uh, Ukraine, which had attacked by uh, uh, now Russia. Uh, so basically, the GPS initiative is focused on uh, bringing the latest uh, uh, technology and innovation to basically you know, on um, underserved rural or war zone to save humanity. So, um, so currently, uh, because of this war happening in uh, Ukraine, uh, our main goal or um, the purpose of the current GPS initiative is to try to help this, uh, with the Ukrainian soldiers and the civilians who sustained the severe uh, traumatic uh, injuries um, as well. And then we, what we are trying to do, we are trying to just try to obtain and see if we can mobilize all this necessary uh, medical equipment and resources to the, uh, the location where they needed most. But at the same time, our long uh, uh, term a goal of GPS initiative will be to try to also continue to help uh, to provide the next generation of uh, uh, prosthetics, for instance, or a new treatment such as wound healing uh, using stem cell uh, to uh, those uh, people afflicted with those uh, injuries. So in fact, that uh, this is actually just something that happened uh, last year. Uh, uh, we know that our colleague in uh, Ukraine in, uh, as a GPS uh, initiative fellow also help a lot in uh, uh, rescuing and uh, uh, rehabilitating other patients uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is actually a picture provided by Dr. Uh, Alexandra. I think we have him here in the audience. Uh, so this is actually the first patient which uh, transferred to uh, Germany for rehabilitation uh, because of their help. And we also uh, actually going in touch, uh, constantly in touch with the Ukrainian embassy in DC to try to see if we can actually promote uh, 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 getting more uh, necessary equipment and mobilize all this necessary treatment uh, in Ukraine or a nearby country. And in fact, that because of uh, this, um, you know, uh, brave activities and uh, service by some of those. Uh, uh, fellows uh, as a GPS uh, initiative, uh, we actually are going to uh, award some of our surgeons and fellows uh, in tomorrow's uh, gala. I think we have most of them in the uh, audience, so we really appreciate your uh, brave service. So uh, lastly, quickly, I would like to actually over, uh, go over a little bit uh, you know, detail about uh, our Congress uh, program. So for those who are uh, uh, the uh, regular speaker, um, um, so be probably not so sure if you are aware of this. So we normally plan a uh, new uh, track and a program right after we finish our um, current program. So this current program, we already 
uh, started uh, the planning back in uh, March of 2022. So this is a really almost like a one year of effort to actually make this uh, uh, program uh, successful. And um, so as I mentioned to you earlier, we always have this uh, weekly meeting or bi-weekly meeting where all of the chairs and co-chairs and track um, chairs are all get together and then discuss about uh, the uh, program, who to in, uh, which topic to focus and uh, who to uh, um, uh, invite. So this is actually the, uh, one of the examples of the subcommittee call schedule. Uh, so as you can see, almost every day we have a tracks, uh, different tracks or different subcommittees meeting. So for instance, in my case, uh, my actually uh, we are in charge of uh, in um, neuro-oncology uh, session. So we meet every Thursday uh, morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, some of us are actually in charge of uh, uh, maybe two or three uh, different subcommittees, so we try our best to try to also participate in all this uh, weekly schedule. So uh, imagine that uh, we have so many different weekly or bi-weekly uh, you know, calls. So how many hours in total? So past one year, we calculated and we probably collectively, we spent about 800 hours or more in calls and in meeting, and then those calls, you know, we just do not, so our uh, you know, work will not end just only by call. After the call, we spend also uh, some time to uh, you know, um, plan and uh, in, uh, invite uh, all the speakers and uh, write all these invitations. And so <laughs> our, uh, probably, we probably might have spent about maybe almost 1,000 hours or more in order to make this uh, um, uh, program successful. So as a result, this year we have uh, nine uh, different tracks with an uh, impressive uh, um, uh, 800 or more speakers, and we have a profile of 14 uh, you know, um, uh, keynote speakers as well as uh, several panel discussions. So that's why uh, we all really we really wish that you know, we all strongly encourage you to stay even after your presentation is over. We uh, all would like you to actually stay and then attend uh, as many uh, sessions as possible. So take advantage of this to learn new things, but then also to network and to foster more collaboration. So we really encourage, I know LA is, has a very nice weather, a lot to you know, go to, to, but then I hope that you stick around uh, during a, a conference and then hopefully you will enjoy all the um, conferences. And also don't forget that we have also a poster presentation in room number 153C. Uh, and also we have uh, also exhibit hall uh, and a brain park uh, hub in a, a room right next to us. So make sure to uh, visit and uh, speak with all these representatives and also the poster presenters. So finally, uh, I would like to acknowledge and a big congratulation and bravo to all the science committees uh, chairs and track chairs and the session chairs. We applaud all the hard work. And also, I really, uh, we all uh, want to also say thank you to those hardworking, dedicated uh, fellows and interns and volunteers as well. And also, we, of course, you know, we also appreciate all the speakers for, uh, for kindly accepting our invitation to speak at our session. And also, of course, all the thank you to all the attendees. And I hope that you all enjoyed our conference. And lastly, but not least, uh, we really, really would like to thank uh, all our sponsors and uh, donors for uh, the generous support. It's because uh, without uh, your support, uh, um, this conference uh, will not have been uh, possible. And especially, I would like to uh, pay uh, 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 yeah, actually, I would like to thank all these platinum sponsors, um, especially the Aramis Group and uh, the Sanders Foundation and Mind Eye Institute and Brain Mapping Foundation. We really thank you for generous um, um, donations and support. So uh, with that, I will end my talk, and I really hope that you enjoy our conference and the rest of the day. Thank you.